Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another Keep Looking Up with the Ward Beecher Planetarium. I'm Tiffany Woolbrick, and we have a, a wonderful crew out tonight. I'm excited to introduce you all. We have Kurt Spivey, our engineer. Hiya. Our uh, student workers, Eleni Hunsik. Hello. And Nishan Adikari. Hello. And our guest speaker tonight, Jody McCullough. Hello. So we are, um, we are going to be talking about astrophotography today. So for those of you who are tuning in right now, um, if you have any questions for Jody uh, about astrophotography, uh, please put those in the comments now. Uh, also, if you happen to have dabbled in astrophotography yourself, feel free to share your photos. We would love to see them in our comments. Uh, but before we get to the astrophotography portion of our show, we're going to start with a little look at our current night sky led by Kurt. So if you have any questions about the current night sky, feel free to include those as well. All right. Anything else before I get going? I, I do want to mention that this is the third to last Keep Looking Up for right now before we uh, stop for the summer. So we'll have two more uh, we do these every other Saturday, uh, so if you, um, you know, if you want to see a keep looking up live, come back and see us. We'll uh, put those on our social media, so just stay tuned on our social media, and we'll see you for for those last couple of keep looking ups. Okay, and uh, I get to do the nighttime sky. I know not many of us have been able to see the nighttime sky much recently. Uh, but there is a lot of really cool stuff out there. Uh, and I just need to do this. And uh, I have a set for about the time we're going to be wrapping up tonight uh, here in Youngstown. This is about nine o'clock. I am happy to say that uh, sunset isn't until 8.06 this evening. Uh, so uh, we do have these nice long evenings. Uh, and uh, I'm looking outside right now. 
might be a little too cloudy to see stuff tonight, but these are all things uh, that you'll be able to see for a uh, time over the next couple of weeks. Uh, first, we're going to start over here in the southwest, and uh, there's only one planet in our evening sky right now. It's right here. That is the planet Mars, and Mars is right next to the moon. One thing that Stellarium does not do well is show us the moon phase, so I actually have to zoom in like that to see we have a thin crescent moon tonight. Last night, the moon was right on top of Mars, and I posted on our Facebook page uh, some pictures from a Facebook group I uh, subscribe to called Earth Sky. Um, if you were down... Um, in the southern hemisphere, the moon actually passed in front of or occulted Mars last night, and I uh, posted some pictures of that event uh, just a couple hours ago, so you'll want to check those out as well. Uh, while we're talking about astrophotography, the moon is a great target when it's in this phase. Uh, for astrophotography, because you look right along this line here that separates the light and the dark. That's called the Terminator, and you can actually see down into craters. You can see mountain ridges. It's really cool to look at uh, through a telescope, and it is a great target for astrophotography. Uh, but we also want to talk about this guy. We're going to talk about Mars, and of course, the big news on Mars has to do with a little tiny helicopter, the Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, they were supposed to take it off last Sunday, uh, but it shut down part of the way through its test on its rotors. Uh, so what NASA did was what we all do. They turned off their computer and they turned it back on. No, actually they did a software upgrade. Uh, the problem was switching it from uh, just spinning the rotors mode to full power mode to make it take off. Uh, and I am happy to report that yesterday they did a full speed test of the rotors on Ingenuity. And right now, um, Ingenuity is scheduled to launch uh, for its maiden flight. Unfortunately for us, it's going to be Monday morning at 3.30 a.m. But by the time you wake up Monday, uh, there ought to be some great pictures and video from Ingenuity uh, on NASA's website. And of course, we will share that as soon as we get it too. We're all really excited about this. Um, I've done a couple of things on the news with this. A good way to think of ingenuity, if you remember back to 1997, the Sojourner rover was the first time we ever tried to do a rover on the surface of Mars. It didn't go very far. It went over a rock and puckered up to it so it could analyze the rock. But now we have spirit, we have opportunity, we have curiosity, we have perseverance, all because of the Sojourner rover. Ingenuity is the same thing. It's just a test concept. It's just got cameras on it. It's not gonna be doing science, but if this works, we may be opening a whole new vista for how we can explore Mars. So stay tuned for that. Okay, I'm gonna pull back here uh, to our Southwestern sky at 9 p.m. Uh, the reason I'm starting over here in the West is we are in the final days of being able to see the winter circle. Now I've heard that nasty S word in the forecast for Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, and uh, that could be because this guy is still over here. That is uh, our uh, buddy uh, in the uh, nighttime sky. That is Orion the Hunter up there. Uh, let me just do that. There we go. And that should work. Yeah, there he is by himself. Uh, he's low in the uh, southwest. He's only up for about two hours after the sun goes down. Still the most prominent constellation, but he is considered a winter constellation because the sun is just down here in Aries. It's going to be entering Taurus the Bull, who is uh, right next to uh, Orion here. Uh, this is Taurus the Bull over here. The sun is preparing to enter that. Once that happens, we won't see... Um, uh, these constellations again until uh, November, December. So uh, we're getting to the point where uh, we're not going to see those too much. I'm going to move over here to the south and almost due south and very high in the sky is this guy. Uh, and that is, whoop, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's try that again. Mm, come on supposed to clear off when I do that. Oh, when I put up a grid. 
that's not good either. Now, how do I get rid of the constellation grid? Uh, and Tiffany, if you uh, remember how to get rid of the grid, let me know. Uh, we'll deal with this uh, anyway. But this is Leo the Lion up here. Uh, this is what's fun about live broadcasts. You never know what you're going to get there um, with uh, when you're doing stuff live like this. Uh, I must have hit. Yes. You, you got something, Tiffany? I'm ah, looking it up. You I got, got it? it. It was E. I was trying to hit W and I hit E. Ah, I've done that before. Yes. There, now I've got Leo all by himself up in the nighttime sky. That's what he looks like uh, in the nighttime sky. Uh, and uh, I can draw him a little bit better like this. So you can see his head is a backwards question mark that we call the sickle. And he is very easy to see in the nighttime sky due south at nine o'clock tonight. I'm going to pull back a little bit and we are going to head over to uh, the, uh, uh oh, I turned those off. There we go. And I'm going to head over to the east. The brightest star in the eastern sky is right here. This star is Arcturus. It is found in the constellation of Boutes, the herdsman. Uh, looks more like a kite, or uh, if you guys come and hear my star talks, we did this two weeks ago too. Uh, that's the base of the ice cream cone. And of course we have our handle scoop of ice cream on top of it. And then there's the scoop that fell off next to it in the constellation uh, Corona Borealis. Uh, so they're both up there and very easy to pick out in the nighttime sky. Uh, I am gonna move ahead just a couple hours here. And this is a quick trick I can do. I can hop two hours just like that. Uh, this is 11 o'clock tonight, our time. Arcturus has climbed in the eastern sky, but now in the northeast, Arcturus happens to be the fourth brightest star in the entire sky. The fifth brightest star in the entire sky has just risen over here. That is Vega. And if you draw a line from Arcturus to Vega, you will pass through this little section of four stars right here. And the reason I'm pointing that out to you is that is the constellation Hercules in the nighttime sky. And as prominent as Hercules is in Greek mythology, this is a difficult constellation to see in the nighttime sky. I will say though, uh, when I got my first real telescope, when I got to my first planetarium back in the late nineties, I was out trying it out in the spring sky and I hit a star cluster right in the middle here. It was a globular cluster uh, called the Hercules cluster. And that was the very first thing. And I just found it by accident, uh, just scanning across and then looked up in a star chart and figured out what it was I hit. Very pretty to look at. I'm sure Jody will talk more about that as well. Uh, those are a few things in our current night sky. And I do believe we are going to be able to see more in the nighttime sky over the next few weeks. But if you get a chance to go out and look at the moon and Mars and the winter circle over here, uh, do uh, take the opportunity the next few days because uh, we are losing the stuff in the Western sky over there. Uh, and if you want to uh, have something to help you out, when you're looking at the nighttime sky in our comments, you will find a link to a uh, printable PDF sky map uh, from a great website we use all the time called skymaps.com. You can uh, print one out there and it'll help you find the stuff in the nighttime sky. With that, I am going to uh, turn you back over first to Tiffany and she will introduce you to Jody. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, wonderful look. Um, it's <laughs> I haven't had a chance to go out lately, so um, it, it's nice to sort of keep up with where things are. Um, thank you, Jody, for coming on today. Uh, Jody McCullough is the president of the Mahoning Valley Astronomical Society. That's our local astronomy club here in the Mahoning Valley. And she's been doing astrophotography for about 18 years now. That's impressive. And uh, she's going to talk to us a little bit about how to get started and what what that's all what astrophotography is all about. If you don't know what that is, don't worry, because you're about to find out. Uh, thank you, Jody. Thank you for coming. OK, thank you. All right. Let me share my screen. Everything's good. OK, it looks great. Yes. Great. OK, so so this is um, astrophotography and introduction. 
And I, as Tiffany said, I'm in the Mahoney Valley Astronomical Society, and you will see pictures from members of our society. We have a lot of uh, very active uh, astrophotographers. And since Kurt mentioned Hercules, I will say this one thing before we get started. Uh, most things that I'm going to show you look very different as a photograph as opposed to looking at them in the night sky. And a lot of people, when they first took the telescope, expect to see the, the pictures that we show. And they don't look like that. But Hercules, the globular clusters to me look the same in a telescope as they do in a photograph. I didn't have that to show you tonight, but but that that just is a, a comment on the globular clusters. So I thought I'd start out with um, some pictures. This was the 2017 eclipse. We were in Wyoming to see it. Some star trails. Uh, we'll talk about this one again later. One of our, our club members uh, took this picture at the beach. And this is probably one of the, my, my favorite pictures of the Horsehead Nebula. And of course, as Kurt mentioned, the popular uh, target is the moon. And there's some fantastic pictures of the moon. And then this, um, how to do planetary photography. So a little overview of what we are going to be talking about. We're going to look at the different levels of astrophotography and, and anybody at any level can participate and do some great things. What equipment you will need for each of these levels. The, you don't just take a picture and that's it. Most of the time you have to do some processing. So what are the resources that you need to process the images? And where do you look for how to, when do I take these pictures and what, what would be a good thing to take a picture of? So resources for that. What this talk is about is what can be done, not, ha not how to do it. Uh, how to do it would take a lot longer. So we're just looking at some of the, the things that you can do in astrophotography. But I'll warn you, Price Runner lists photography as the most expensive hobby. And Tiffany and I, participate in the least expensive hobby, knitting. So knitting, if you price out the cost per time, there's kind of a graph showing you that knitting doesn't cost much. You buy a few needles and yarn and you've got it made. Astrophotography though, skyrockets. The more you do, the more you want. Now I figure since I do both knitting and astrophotography that my graph kind of looks like this. So I think I'm in good shape because I'm a little bit of both. Uh, I will say that um, I have it, given Tiffany a list of resources of things we're going to talk about in this presentation tonight. You don't need to copy any of this down. She'll have this information for you. So I just, that you'll, these will come up. Just keep in mind, you'll have a copy later. So different levels of astrophotography and where you can get involved. You could do um, still photography. That means you're not, you're not tracking the night sky. You could do a single shot or you can do multiple shots and we'll show you each of these in, in turn. Then, you could put your camera on something that tracks. So as the earth spins, the night sky appears to move, your camera will track and so that you can take a little longer exposures and get some more interesting photos. And finally, if you want to connect to a telescope, uh, you can do, and we'll talk a little bit about what a guided telescope picture is and an unguided. Um, so in level of complexity, we're starting at the top with still photography and we're ending with the guided. So we'll start with the kind of the easiest one first. Um, this is a cell phone image. Um, this was taken actually from the roof of Mount Union College, looking at the dome, looking north. And it was, uh, this was a, a meteor that kind of came through at the time. I have tried forever to get good meteor trails. And this person got a great trail just by taking the picture, Brandon did. Uh, and this was taken with a um, uh, nightcap on an um, iPhone 11. But um, so that was a great picture. This is another one taken inside. Uh, this is by Jacob here. Um, he was looking, if you can see, we talked about Orion tonight, looking through the slit in the dome with the telescope in the foreground and you see Orion. So, you know, th there are great Hubble pictures out there and we are never going to compete with Hubble pictures, but there are some things that you will never see this. You'll never see this. So your pictures are different. That's why we all take the talk do photographs is there, they mean more to you as you look at them. So uh, accomplished just by using a cell phone. So what do you need? Well, you're gonna need something to stabilize the cell phone uh, and you can have just a tripod, little tripod, you can get these little tiny tripods. Or if you want to connect your cell phone to a, a, uh, a telescope, 
Uh, you can try hand holding it, but those are a little difficult. These things will actually hold the camera in place for you so you can take your picture and not have to worry about where things are. And they, they are very, they're, they're about you know, $50. They're kind of worth their weight in gold if you want to do things through a telescope. And then um, this app, and this is what uh, Brandon used in his picture with the meteor trail. Uh, it's a, an app for, and I think it's $3, uh, it's a phone app. I believe, I think it only works on the iPhone. It's called Nightcap, um, Night Capture. And it lets you do star trails, it lets you do ISS. There are all kinds of features for it. I don't do a lot with this, but it's certainly a good way to, I mean, if you've got a phone, it's a good way to start doing astrophotography right off the bat. By the way, and Tiffany mentioned this, if you have any questions, uh, if you want me to elaborate on something, don't hesitate to ask. All right, so we're going to go on then. We're, we're getting more complex as we go along. This is with a, not a DSLR. This is just a single um, single shot with a fixed lens camera, inexpensive camera. Um, so this is of the planet Mercury looking over at our neighbor's house. My husband took this picture. And again, you're not going to see that on the internet, but it, it means something to us because I, my neighbor's house and there's Mercury, so it looks really cool. Um, this one, it was pretty cloudy that morning, but we still got the shot. So there's the moon and, um, and Venus in that shot. Uh, here's another one. It's got Jupiter and Venus and the moon. Uh, again, just an inexpensive, not even DSLR, just an inexpensive camera. This could have been cell phone too. Um, similar to that. Um, another one with Jupiter and Saturn and Venus. Uh, these are just quick. Kate, hey, look, it's really cool this morning. Grab the camera. Let's take a picture. You don't have to do a lot of planning for that. This is another club member. Larry Plant took this picture of Mars and Jupiter and the moon. And you, know, you can see that there was a chimney nearby. And, and this was with, a, again, a, a Pentax camera, but um, single shot. This one took a little bit of effort. This was the conjunction um, that happened this, maybe you may have heard about it in the news, it happened the 27th of December, right after Christmas. And we were as expected clouded out. So my husband and I took a trip to where we thought it was going to be clear. We were kind of close. We got a little few clouds. We went to Granite Falls, North Carolina, and this is um, Jupiter and Saturn. And that's, that was taken with a 50 millimeter lens. So that's pretty accurate to what it looked like in the sky. And then this isn't quite a still picture because we did take a telescope along too. And so there's a telescope view of the two of them there, of Jupiter and Saturn together. Okay, this is another one, still, still photography, just a regular camera. This was with a DSLR, but um, here's the Big Dipper, kind of upside down. And there's an Iridium flare. We aren't getting many of those anymore. The Iridium satellites are almost, I think they're gone now, but they used to be pretty popular to watch these Iridium flares. Not a meteor, but it kind of looks like that. This was last summer, uh, Comet Neowise, you may have heard about that. This is uh, the Big Dipper looking north and there's Comet Neowise. So okay, but it, I like it gives a perspective of how big the comet was that we saw in the night sky. But you, know, you can do some other kind of art artsy things with a still camera and astronomy. So this is a club member, Don Cherry, and Don does some really, Don's background is, is actually, a, he's a photographer. So he does a lot more of the creative things uh, with his photography. So he had a glass ball that he put up and got the Milky Way, him pointing at it. So again, that's different. You're not gonna see that. That's a unique photograph. Uh, another one that Don took, um, I've forgotten where he goes in North Carolina, but this is on the beach and you can see the Milky Way and there's a lighthouse in the background. That looks like Body Island Lighthouse. Uh, it might near, well be. Near I, I, th head. I think so. I think that's where he goes. Hey, this one is a single shot. Roy and I went to um, uh, Yellowknife in, in uh, Canada to see um, the Northern Lights and we got, oh, this was actually, this was actually in Svalbard, I'm sorry. This was during an eclipse. We saw the eclipse during the day and we saw this at night. It was probably the most spectacular day of our lives because we got the, both of them. So this was a, the, uh, the Northern Lights from almost the North Pole. And it was just a single shot with a wide field camera. So that's why things are kind of curved. Okay, moon take, features a lot. You can do some cool things. Don was, Don Cherry again was trying, has been trying to get a shot like this for a long time. He was really excited. He actually got the airplane and the moon together. Another single shot. This is just uh, the comet Neowise from last summer. Clouds were there, but they still were kind of neat. 
The sun is getting more active. This is another club member, Dan Schneider, took this single shot of, of a sunspot, pretty large sunspot, with just a camera and a telescope. Here's just another club member, Phil Plant, took this picture of the moon. It was the, a super moon, so you can't really tell it's bigger than normal, but it's a super moon. So what do you need if you're going to take these kinds of pictures? Well, obviously you need a camera, some kind of a camera. It, it could be the cell phone, it could be a fixed lens camera, or it could be a DSLR. You need a way to secure this hand holding. It doesn't work well with photography. There's night sky photography because you need longer exposures. So a tripod uh, to connect that up. It's helpful um, to not have to press the shutter release to take a picture because when you do that, you shake the camera. So many of us use this device called an intervalometer. And I know some of the uh, more expensive cameras actually have an intervalometer built in, but this thing you can set how many pictures you want, how long exposure you want, how many, how many uh, seconds between each picture. So they come in very handy. As you're doing that, um, if you're taking things in the night sky, it's pretty dark. So you need to increase your exposure time. You need to increase your ISO. Some, some other things to think about, and you just have to kind of play with this with your camera, but you'll need a higher ISO than you would in the daytime. And you need to be able to, to choose bulb on your camera. Again, if it's not the cell phone, the cell phone that nightcap actually does that for you. Settings, depending on the lens you're using, anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds. Beyond that, the stars begin to trail. So if you want something, and again, it depends on what, what the lens is you're using with that one. Then you need to process these pictures. So 10 to 30 seconds would be a good time for these bulb settings. Um, you could use Photoshop, but it's expensive. And what we currently, and, and there are as many different um, processing programs as there are astrophotographers. So I'm going to present what my husband and I use a lot. Um, Images Plus. Images Plus is currently free. Images Plus used to sell for $350, but the um, the author who lives in um, Rootstown, Ohio, uh, is retired and didn't want to really upkeep the program, so he offered it for free. So uh, it, it isn't just that it's free, it's a great program, so we use that for all of our image processing. Okay, so now we're looking at still photography. Again, still photography and with a tripod, but now putting multiple shots together to get a cool effect. This was nothing special happening. The moon was rising. What I loved is the fact that it goes from red to really bright because the horizon really does make things look red. And I, I just love the shot here. And this is a, a club member from New Jersey, actually. He comes to our club meetings occasionally. Don Cherry took this picture, the, the clouds kind of got in the way. Again, the moon was just going across the sky. There's nothing, no special event, but it makes a really fantastic shot. This is a series of individual shots that are combined. And I, I will talk to you a little bit about the software that we use to combine those. So individual, I think they were 15 seconds long on a tripod with a DSLR and a 50 millimeter lens and just a series to get the star trails. So there's Polaris right there. Not quite the center, but pretty close. And I, I like to have something interesting in the foreground. This is actually a moon moonlit night. So the tree is being lit up by the moon behind me. I'm looking north and the moon's to the south. So that kind of helped actually with, with something else I could do that night. Okay, we've already talked about this one. This is Wyoming, uh, this picture looking at the, at the total eclipse. And then this next one was from um, South America. And we were actually on an alpaca farm. And so that it almost, we didn't get quite the end, the, the sunset right behind these mountains. This was a series of Aurora shots that we put together in a, I think my husband used to Photoshop to put those together, but it made kind of a nice little movie. So, so what do we use to, to do these? Um, we can use a program called Star Stacks and it's free. Um, and it's very simple and easy to use. You just drop your images in. As long as your tripod didn't move, as long as there, everything was there, it would stack all those pictures together. Now, some of these I'm sure were put together with Photoshop, but Star Stacks will do a great job. And in fact, both of those uh, Eclipse pictures I put together with, with Star Stacks. Okay, so we're, we're getting a little more complex as we go along. Any, anybody have any questions? Okay, the next is a, a tracking camera. This will follow the sky. And there's a lot of ways to accomplish that. So this was taken, this is the Pleiades cluster and this was a comet. Um, tracking camera, Don Cherry took this of the Orion Nebula. This is in the belt of Orion. 
It's one of a, a probably more favorite targets of most astrophotographers. This is a running man. You can kind of see him there. Here is a, a constellation-wide uh, view. This was taken with uh, an 85 millimeter lens on a camera with a tracking camera. So these were, I think, 10 seconds long, and there were a series of them. We put them together, but um, did some things to enhance the constellation. There's the Orion Nebula, Betelgeuse, a little red because of the, the kind of camera that was used. This was Comet Neowise. The, this was a series of pictures. Notice it looks something weird going on here. The stars moved because we tracked on the comet. So the comet was not moving at the same rate the stars were moving. So this is from last summer. What I wanted to be able to catch was the ion tail and we, we did get a little of that. So these two are both taken with a tracking camera also. This was a single shot and there were clouds. This was taken when we went to South America for the eclipse two years ago. And we're out in the Atacama Desert where it is dark, very dark. In fact, I never realized this, but clouds are black when you don't have light pollution around. So there were clouds coming across, but this was a single shot. When you take a multiple shots, those clouds get averaged out. So it's an advantage of why you wanna take more than one, one picture. So multiple actually removes it. So what do you need if you're going to do these kinds of shots? Well, obviously, again, you need the camera and the tripod. And if you can do something like an intervalometer to, to do the shots so you don't move the camera. And then you need a tracker of some sort. Um, this is a lightweight tracker. You can arrange, orient the camera in all kinds of directions. This one runs around $318. These are um, used to be called barn door trackers because they put screws on something like a hinge and you could actually slowly turn the screw and, and actually do it yourself. But now it's a lot better. You can buy these motorized ones. So some kind of a tracking camera. You could also use a telescope mount for tracking. Of course, if you have that, if you don't, that's much more expensive and it's not as portable. And then processing all, Everything in astrophotography is, we may work the whole night and get one picture. And sometimes people say, well, that's it, that's all you got? Well, it took us all night to get that picture. So programs to process, and I mentioned Images Plus already, it's a stacking program. It will let us take like those comet pictures you saw, we, we put those together and, and enhance them a little bit in Images Plus. Next is um, taking pictures of planets. Um, and these are now through a telescope. We used a web, well, kind of a modified webcam. These are videos. We might take, and we, our video camera actually is a black and white camera. And we take red, green, and blue through red, green, blue filters, images of whatever our target is. In this case, last summer, it was Mars. Uh, this was from October. And this was the view we were looking at. You can see some of the clouds on Mars. You can definitely see the polar cap there. So this might've been, um, I'm trying to remember how many images each image might have been a, like a thousand. So I might have had a thousand red pictures, a thousand, a thousand frames of red, a thousand of green, a thousand of blue, and put them all together to get a single frame, sharpened them, did some things to process them. But th that's done with a video camera. This is also a video camera shot. This was Jupiter. And this is at opposition when Jupiter is directly opposite the sun in the sky. This is actually the night of opposition. It was very clear. There is uh, the moon Io, and because it's an opposition, Io's shadow is right underneath it. So it was kind of neat to be able to capture that. Here is one of Saturn, again, a, a video, a series of pictures taken there. This is from this last summer. Uh, this is actually the one day they, they were all visible, but Mars wasn't, remember Mars didn't reach opposition until later in the year and Jupiter and Saturn are almost in opposition here. So this was 15 days from opposition. That means the closest approach for us, 21 days from opposition, and this is 107 days. So Mars looks smaller, of course it is smaller, but it's not as distinct either. Um, but it definitely picked out, all these were taken with the video camera. But you don't have to use a video camera for just for planets. Anything solar system is great for a video camera. So um, these, this was taken through a special type of a, a filter that lets us block the sunlight and lets us see a, a small narrow band of the sun called the hydrogen alpha band. There is a sunspot and here's a prominence and, and they are pinkish in color. Um, so that one's with that one. This is a picture taken through a telescope, again, a video. 
of a crater on the moon and we maybe that was a 15 second video i don't know how many frames there were and then the software that we used goes in and sharpens and stacks them and it looks pretty great our night sky wobbles a bit and if you watch the video we'd see the wobbling but the picture then we can get rid of that with our processing so if you want to take these kinds of pictures well obviously if you're going to kick anything like a the planet that's close up you need a telescope any kind of telescope and you would need a mount uh, the mount, there are two different kinds of telescope mounts. One's called alt as, which go up and down and right and left. I'm, my, my screensaver, my, my background's getting a mess there. Then the other are called equatorial mounts. For astrophotography, equatorial mounts are preferred. With, with the alt as mount, you do get what they call field rotation. Well, our, this is our webcam. It's just a little small camera and connects right to the telescope, goes right in where your eyepiece would go. And then it connects right to our, our computer. And the software, the software for this is free. It's called Fire Capture. And my husband was just remarking to me today how all these great programs are for astrophotography, they write the programs and they offer them free to the astrophotography community. It's not that we're using these because they're free, we're using them because they're the best and they're, they just happen to be free, which is pretty cool. So this is the capture software that will let us capture however many pictures we want. We can tell it that I want, you know. Um, 90 seconds of the red, 90 of the green, where 90 of the blue, and do this five times. Jody, a question on those filters. Yes. Uh, is on that camera, is there a, a spot to put on the filter, or do you have to <laughs> manually take off the, uh, the camera, change the filter, and put it back in? What, what we use is there's a special filter wheel. I didn't put this on here. It's a, we, we actually have an electronic filter wheel that the computer controls. So when I say do 90 seconds with the red filter, it'll rotate the red filter in front of the camera. And then in 90 seconds, it'll rotate. So the green filter is in place. And then 90 seconds, it'll do the blue. We used to do a manual filter and it seemed to be, it was always my job in the dead of winter to turn the filter wheel. Well, they're metal and you can't do it with gloves on. And so I said, we're going to get rid of that and get a get an electronic filter wheel. There is a place to put a filter on. So if you were doing just like a hydrogen alpha, you could, but then you'd have to take the camera out to do that, which means you might change your focus. So we, and, and you get, the problem is the planet's going to rotate in the process. So we want something pretty quick, especially for Jupiter and Saturn, they do rotate. So the electronic filter wheel really makes a big difference for us. You, you can also get these cameras in color and some of the more recent ones are pretty good in color, but the ones when we first got started, the color just, it, it lost some light because you've got three different colored filters there blocking the light. So the monochrome always gives you the best. All right, so how do you process these? Well, guess what? Um, the programs are free again, but these are the ideal ones. So. All the planetary ones were processed first, and it's a, it's a long, complicated process. Auto stackered, and then you go to Registax to sharpen it a little bit. And in particular, when you're doing a planet like Jupiter that rotates while you're taking the pictures, it does rotate. This program called WinJupos actually derotates it. It's pretty spectacular. We also use it to combine our red, green, and blue images. And again, all of those, all that software is free. And then of course images plus then we'll touch up the pictures that we do. All right, so that's videos. Well, what about just photos through a telescope? These are tracking photos. So that the telescope being used has a motor that will track the stars across the sky. It will rotate at the same rate that the earth rotates. And so the star stays put to a degree, no telescope perfectly tracks. And so we have to do one further thing, but for short images, this tracking works well. So this is a lunar eclipse of 2019. Uh, this was through a telescope. And then these were also through a telescope. I just shrank them so you could kind of see the, uh, the progression of the eclipse. So that's always kind of fun. And, and it, it, you know, you'll see a lot of people take eclipse pictures. Uh, they can orient it however they want. Um, this was a telescope photo taken by our club member, Don Cherry. And this one's kind of neat. As you can see at the top of the screen, it's got Mars there. This was the closest approach between Mars and the moon. Um, so that's kind of how close they were in the sky. It's pretty impressive. And you can definitely see in this book picture, you can see the orange of Mars. So it came out pretty nice. Um, Larry Plant took this picture, another photograph of the moon. As I said, moons are pretty popular. This was taken through uh, a telescope. 
and it was tracking. Tracking, you wouldn't really need the tracking with the moon because it's so bright, your pictures are short, but then you've got to keep things in play. And then you can stack them to make them a little cleaner. Here's another club member, Dave Ruck took this one, another picture of the moon. And all of these are tracking pictures through a telescope. So this one's a picture from Carl Pennington. This is M45. This is uh, the Pleiades cluster. And if you take a long, I think these are, he varies, he usually takes one and a half to two minute long exposures. So that's why you need a bulb setting and it, it'll let you soak in more light. And then this may be, I don't know how many pictures he had, maybe 20, 30 of those all combined together to get this. You don't normally see the nebulosity around the Pleiades. So if you look through a telescope, this is not what you see, but with our camera, we can pick up the very faint light. Okay, this, uh, these are two galaxies. This is M51. These are two galaxies interacting with each other. So you can kind of see them sort of pulling the tear out of each other. Um, so this again would probably have been maybe 20, 20, 30 images, each of them two minutes long um, stacked. Um, this one, Don Cherry took this one. I, I'm thinking Don can go three minutes on his. So you have to watch how long you take your pictures because telescopes aren't perfect in their tracking and eventually the stars will trail a little bit. So you have to kind of know what your limit is. This is a triangular galaxy. Um, this is one that my husband and I took. This is Markarian's chain. What you see here are galaxies. This is a chain. This is Markarian's chain of galaxies. I think, I think somebody counted. There's 27 galaxies in here somewhere. There's a lot, there's a lot of galaxies. Uh, this was taken uh, a series of pictures. Uh, these were, I think, five minutes long each. And then there were probably about 20 of them that were combined to get this one picture. So this would have been the whole night's work to get this one picture. This happened last spring, this in April of a year ago, Venus actually moved through the Pleiades. Now remember, we showed you Carl's picture with all the nebulosity. Unfortunately, Venus was so bright, there was no way we could accomplish that. So here are those stars in the Pleiades, and this represents three different nights. So these, these were individual photographs taken three separate nights and then combined. I think I put them together in uh, Images Plus to see that. Well, this fall, Mars was close to the Pleiades. Now, Mars is a lot fainter, so we were able to expose for longer and not blow out the picture. So there's Mars. It doesn't look like the other pictures of Mars it's because we overexposed, but then we could see the, the nebulosity around the Pleiades. Again, a tracking photo. Um, this was, Don Cherry took this. This is a supernova remnant called the Veil Nebula. And so tracking photo right for that one, a tracking. Here's another one. This is uh, M16. This is the Eagle Nebula. Can you see the claw, the, uh, the, the mouth of the eagle there? Um, again, a tracking photo, uh, stacked images. Um, this one, M42, the Orion Nebula is a pretty easy one to photograph because it's pretty bright. So this one may have been 10 second long, so maybe like, like 30, 20 or 30 images together to get the Orion Nebula, to get all the color you see there. So if you want something like that, obviously you need a telescope and you need a mount to track it. And they're coming. And you need a camera. We we tend to stick with a DSLR because they we can do that in one night. We can take all our pictures, it's color. Something to let you trigger the shutter because with a telescope, if you touch that camera, you shake that, you shake it. Even the mirror. Sometimes we lock up the mirror so the mirror on the camera doesn't shake the telescope. So we use, uh, again, an intervalometer that we could set. We tend to, because we're at home and we can do this from home, we have electricity, we use a, a computer program. And this one is not free. It's called Backyard EOS. We're using Canon cameras, but there's also a Backyard Nikon. They don't have it for any other kind of cameras. It runs $50, but it's a lifetime program. So they've updated it several times since we purchased it. And it will let you capture, it'll show you what you're seeing. Um, the screen on a, on a camera in the dark is really hard to center things. This will let us take longer exposures and we can see, okay, we've got that centered the way we want to know we need to move it over a little bit. We fuss a little bit to get things in the right place. So this is really worthwhile as having this, this capture program. And then of course, we've got to stack those images. And by stacking, I mean, we take, we take these pictures and we combine them to get even more light. So rather, you can't take a 30 second long, a 30 minute long picture. Um, light pollution would fog it, stars would trail, but we take a bunch of pictures and put them together and it's equivalent to that. So this again is another images plus 
crossing from. All right, so the last type, this is where it gets really expensive. So this is where the, the top of that curve is. Um, this is not only just tracking, but I mentioned that telescopes aren't perfect and over time things will move. So if I'm going to take, this was a, this one actually was a 10 minute exposure, a series of them. I think it was probably 30 of them. So definitely all night long. Over time, those stars move. So we, we have to do something called guiding where we use another camera to guide. It used to be done by hand. You would look in a, another, while your camera was taking a picture, you'd look in an eyepiece and you would slowly move your telescope to keep a star on a crosshair. Today, there are software and cameras that'll do that work for us. So basically we're using two cameras, one to image and one to guide. So we're, we're tracking with our telescope mount and then we're refining that with the guiding. So this is the Leo triplet. And these are three galaxies in the constellation Leo. And this little spiral's got some pretty neat features here. Nice features there. This is like the hamburger is what I like to call it. But that, um, again, you, you wouldn't get this kind of detail if you didn't take a long exposure in a lot of them. Um, this is another one. Uh, this is the Horsehead Nebula. Um, there's a lot of red in the background. This is a dark nebula. Uh, and there's a, this is called the flame also taken with tracking and guiding so that, that the stars are close to pinpoint. That's one of the issues that astrophotographers have is keeping those stars nice and round. This is the veil, another picture, our picture of the veil um, with a telescope, again, tracking and guiding. This is probably one of my favorite ones because my favorite color is purple. This is the Iris Nebula. And uh, there's a lot of dark dust in here. It's blocking the stars, you can see that but this is tracked and guided. And this, this is probably, I'm pretty sure this is, I think it was uh, 15 exposures that were 10 minutes long each. Uh, it, the more exposures, the better, but we typically don't get four hours without something going wrong. The moon comes up, the clouds come in, so on. This is the Helix uh, Nebula. This is sometimes called the Eye of God. Um, the, and this one could use some more images, a little bit grainy, but you know, just don't get enough images. This was pretty low in the sky for us, but tracking and guiding for this one too. This one's kind of a fun one. Uh, this was, this is uh, M46, which is an open cluster. And it happens to have a little planetary nebula, not in it, but it looks like it's in it. The planetary nebula is actually closer. So this is a close up on that little planetary nebula. So it showed up pretty nice to see it. And these are two galaxies, uh, M81, M82. Um, M82 has um, a lot of hydrogen alpha coming out and the camera, camera picked that up. You can also see the red hydrogen alpha in the spiral arms where new stars are being born in these regions of this particular galaxy. So that's tracking and guiding. This is the Trifid. This is also, this is M20, uh, summertime of constellation, or it's in, it's in Sagittarius, you see it in the summertime. You certainly aren't going to see the colors through a telescope. You would just see a fuzzy cloud, but dark dust lines there and the red is where a star's light is coming through and the blue is where a star's light is reflecting. So there's a star in here somewhere. They look like they're the same distance, but they're actually not quite there. All right, so what does it take? This is the, again, the top of the curve. Well, you'll need a telescope and you'll need a mount. And obviously you need a camera to take the pictures and something to trigger that camera, either that or the computer. Then here's what we mean by guiding. There's a second telescope. It's a, well, uh, there's many ways of doing this. What we do is we have a second telescope attached to the main telescope and we put another camera on it. That's the guide camera. And there's software that runs that, that keeps the star on the crosshair. If everything goes well, it, it keeps that star. It still does move, but in the, hopefully in our 10 minutes, it doesn't. I couldn't take 30 minutes or it wouldn't move. All right, so we, we definitely use the, the backyard EOS for our imaging camera. And the, the software that, and this is all for free. And again, this is the best stuff. Everybody uses it. It just happens to be free. This is called PhD2. It's for um, guiding, it, it was the person who originally wrote it was push here dummy is what this stands for. Uh, but here's the star and the crosshair. This graph shows you how well it's tracking and that's free too. So that will automate, once we get things set up, our image is there we want to, then we guide. And then of course we also process again in images plus. So I've shown you all the different levels from simple to more expensive, but there's you know, some issues here. The first problem 
being an astrophotographer is the one I mentioned at the very beginning, money. What, what do you want? Are you, going to, you, can, you can work down here. You can also work up here. You gotta have, it costs some money to do that. We can't do anything about that. Beautiful, but not good for astronomy. And Northeast Ohio, we see a lot of this. There's nothing we can do about those nights. And tonight, sure looks like one of those nights. So that's another problem that we can't, we can't resolve. The moon is a problem for us. And I, I mentioned the one star trail. That was great because it lit up my, my background. So if I had a neat tree or some, a lake with a reflection off the lake, that'd be great. But most of the time, uh, we can't do any of our deep sky. But there's a solution for this one. But the moon's a problem. Light pollution is a problem. I don't, but people don't think of light pollution. So this was the 1950s. It was pretty dark. In the 1970s, it's getting pretty bright. Here's 97. Here's the prediction for four years from now, how bright the night sky is going to be. And light pollution is a, a serious issue. You need to be in a dark sky spot. But there are a couple of ways of around the moon and light pollution. And we these are pretty new. And, and there are some club members that are just learning to do that. The solution is a filter um, that blocks the moonlight and blocks light pollution. So here, here's a picture taken probably on a moonlit night of the Veil Nebula. I didn't, this I got off the web. And here's a picture taken through that filter. So the moon is blocked and we can see much more detail in the Veil Nebula. Well, we have one of these uh, filters and we took this picture of the Medusa Nebula. It was a full moon night, which we would never image in a full moon night. And it was not far, it was probably 15 degrees away from the Medusa, it was really close. We thought, well, let's just try it and see. And we got a pretty nice picture from that. So it's a way around some of the problems. All right, I mentioned, I would talk a little bit about when. You know, here, when do you shoot? If you want to shoot satellites, there's a website and all these resources are on the information that Tiffany's gonna post. Um, Heavens Above site, you can choose the satellite, like you could choose the ISS. If I, if I clicked on the ISS, here's what would come up. It would tell you when the visible passes are, it would give you the date, it would tell you how bright it is, what time. And even if you click on the date, the blue date, it'll show you what that pass will look like. So you could say, all right, I want to get the ISS moving through the sky. So I will put my camera here. I want to get this region of the Hercules cluster that Kurt was talking about earlier. I'll get the Hercules and I'm going to get the ISS passing through it. So you could, you could plan for that. If you want to shoot the sun, if you want to look at comets, if you want to look at aurora, this is the place to go. Spaceweather.com tells you what's happening. If there's a new comet, or if there, and it always shows you what the sun is looking like that time. So it's a, a great reference. And there's actually a lot of, everybody submits their photos there so you can see what other people are doing. So you can kind of say, well, they're getting good pictures of a comet. I'm going to try that too. Another place to look is uh, skyandtelescope.com. It, it tells you what is happening this week in a glance. So you can see what's happening. Like this particular one shows you where the Saturn and the moon are. So it, it can tell you what's happening in the night sky. Uh, the program that, that Kurt was using tonight, Stellarium, great program, it's free. Again, some of these things we use because they're free, but most of we use them because they're great. At Stellarium.com is free and you can see what you can actually plan your shots with Stellarium if you're going to, to figure out what you want to use. For example, you can put in your, your lens size or telescope size and the camera lens or whatever you're using, and you can see how that frames what you want to frame. Like if you wanted to get Jupiter and Saturn and the moon, then I've got this set up for the particular camera that will do that. So rather than wait to the last minute and in the dark say, oh, I need, a, I need the other lens, you know right away what lens to use. Our favorite app is Sky Safari. And it, it depending when you can get, they periodically like three or four times a year offer it for sale half price. You certainly wanna wait for that. Uh, there are three different levels. We use the, the pro level and it on sale at $20. This is for your um, iPad or your phone. And same thing there, I've put in my camera particulars. I've I've said I want to put 21 millimeter lens on um, this camera, the EOS 60DA, and it'll show me what view of the sky I will get. So I know, okay, the 21 millimeter lens is perfect for that. We can also use this software called CCD Calculator, and it also shows you some of the things you could look at. It too is free. And uh, this one just shows you the, what 
the particulars are the telescope. You can set up the telescope and camera, and then you can choose what you want to take a picture of. It's got a bunch of things in this pull down menu, but this is the sun, so we could plan, okay, here's the size we want to use for that. Well, what can you image? Meteor showers are pretty cool. It's, it's probably the one thing in 18 years we've never been successful at, but this year, I'm hoping it's either clouded out or some reason, but this year we have a chance. So this year, the Perseids peak of the night of August 11th and 12th, and the moon will be 13% full. So it's not, it means be better if it's a new moon, but it's not too bad. So yeah, you would like a new moon night. You obviously need clear skies. You need dark skies. So if you've got light pollution, you want to set your ISO and your camera pretty high. So those faint meteors are picked up and you want your f-stop low. Um, wide angle lens on a tripod be great for that. Well, lunar eclipses are cool to take pictures of. The next one, full, now there's a couple partials in between here and then, but the next full lunar eclipse happens May the 15th, uh, 2022, 2022, and it's gonna be total for us here, okay? Solar eclipses. Hey, be, be ready for this one. Now you'll need a filter for this and you'll need some help getting, figure out what to do with that. Uh, the next eclipse, a solar eclipse is 2024. Those solar eclipse pictures I showed you, there was a filter on until totality. The filter was taken off and then put right back on again because you need to protect your optics. So you, you need to look a little bit about how to do that. But this particular one comes right over top of us, uh, Cleveland, Akron, but it's April the 8th, which is, this year, April the 8th was sunny, so who knows, but that's the next chance you have of a total solar eclipse. Well, if you need help, where do you go? We're here. Uh, our club, we've got several people that do uh, astrophotography, you have questions, come join us. We are still meeting virtually right now, but if you go to our website, and that's one of the things that's listed on the list of resources that Tiffany has, www.mvobservatory.com. This is our website. We've got a lot of things here to, to show you there. Um, this is our observatory. We're in Braceville. We have a 16 inch telescope. We've got an eight inch refractor. We've got a 25 inch reflector. We have a 14 inch scope that's not in here right now. And this happens to be one of our star parties. So we got a bunch of people out there. I'm not sure we're going to run our star party this year. Right now, all of our uh, open events are canceled. Uh, even you say, well, you're outside, but the problem is people would be looking in an eyepiece and that would be a way to spread COVID. So we cannot have our stargazes. So we are not doing anything this year. And well, well, we'll see where that goes. These are some of the telescopes that we have at our club. And just a little bit more on the website. If you go in the website under calendar, you can see when our meetings are, um, various things there. And they contact us right here. I'll, just, I'll highlight that. If you go to the contact form, that comes right to me. So if you have questions, feel free to contact us. I, I can let you know when our next meeting is. Um, I'm trying to remember the date for our next meeting. The end of the month, the last Saturday of this month. Uh, and we'll have a, a, a Zoom meeting, so I would have to send a link. Uh, but if you're interested in attending, I'm not sure what our speaker is yet on that event. But anyway, so I thought I'd end it with this. People sat outside and looked at the stars each night. I'll bet they'd live a lot differently. So are there any questions? Um, while you and I were talking filters, uh, Don, who is listening, uh, chimed in and asked, are those parfocal filters? Okay, so, so the ones we have are parfocal, but actually the software will let you set if you have, remember I said this, the price goes up. Um, the software that we use, Fire Capture, actually lets you adjust if you have a um, electronic focuser you can go in and say all right for the blue filter here's my position that the focus is before you start your sequence and then here for the red filter here's what my focus position is and then for the green filter here's the focus position and it'll automatically focus between each shot ours we haven't been doing that because uh, we think ours are part focal but some of them are not so you have to be careful about that and uh, Christina says, uh, compliments you on your beautiful images and thanks you for your information. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Jody, so much for, wow, sharing these beautiful images. Just, 
truly stunning. Um, I, I mean, I've I've seen some of y'all's images before, but I I'm always impressed every time. Um, so so thank you for sharing those. Uh, if we have any uh, follow up questions for Jody later. Um, uh, please feel free to comment those if you're seeing this later, uh, not live. Uh, still comment. We'd love to answer your questions. Um, the all of the links that Jody referenced throughout her talk are are listed in the comments below. And um, is it? Let's see, is there? I think I think that's it. Well, um, oh, our show next Saturday, so uh, twenty. What, when would that be? The 20, the first. Oh yeah, that's right. May 1st. That's a house. Beltane. Beltane. That's right. So May 1st, our next Keep Looking Up will be about uh, star classification. How do we classify different star types and uh, a star's life cycle? So stars are formed and they have uh, a natural end. And depending on the type of star, uh, <laughs> that can look a lot different. So you'll learn more about that uh, at our next Keep Looking Up. Um, do we have anything else before we sign off? Um, this Tuesday on Facebook and YouTube, look for a brand new video. Thanks to Nishan, uh, a life of a scientist on Wilhelmina Fleming. Uh, where I almost have that finished. <laughs> I'll finish it up Monday. Uh, and uh, it's a very good one. So be sure to catch that. Yes, that'll be on our uh, Facebook and YouTube on Tuesday. And, and before uh, next Keep Looking Up, you've got a conver Cosmic Conversation on. Yes, I believe our next Cosmic Conversation is going to be on Black Holes. But um, that's subject to change. That, that uh, particular uh, segment is meant to be casual and sort of on the fly. So uh, I guess you'll have to find out next uh, Monday. Um, when's that one? A week, a week from this Monday. A week from this Monday, so the 26th, uh, April 26th. Well, we'll see you. Uh, that's a live program. So we'd love to see you for that. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Jody. Um, Thanks, I saw Jody. Don. I saw Don in the comments, phenomenal photos, Don. Wow. I mean, I've always been struck by the, his beautiful photos, astrophotography and not. So um, thank you for sharing those. Uh, I hope everyone has a good evening. So uh, remember to keep looking up.